Good day to all of the Kingdom Praying Women 365. God bless you. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to be able to come to you with um, something that God has really placed on my heart. I am not one for uh, social media. I'm not particularly loving being in front or behind a camera. But I just want you to um, take this time to share with you the brethren and those that follow Kingdom Praying Women, whether it be men, whether it be women, um, young people, young adults, everyone. I just wanted to take time to share what God has placed on my heart. And I believe we are living in really difficult times. So let me just um, set the foundation for our first meeting together, what I'm going to entitle chapter one. And I am putting this under a banner of um, redeeming the time. That's what the Lord placed on my heart. And the scripture reference for that is Ephesians 5 and 16 and Colossians 4 and 5. And this is where the Apostle Paul said to redeem the time to buy back time, uh, regain its possession because we're living in evil days and being careful to use our time wisely uh, because the clock of time is ticking and we are now in a new year, um, 2024. The clock of time is ticking and we are moving forward and the time of the Lord is much closer than when we first began. So the Lord laid on my heart, um, as I said, this overarching theme, redeeming the time. And wanting me, and I guess I would like for the listeners and for the brethren to know that um, we have to redeem time, gain back time, buy back time somehow through the word of God and to make that time make an impact. And in order for it to be any, to make an impact, then we need to be wise about what we do. So really that's the foundation from where I'm coming from. And the topic that the Lord laid on my heart, and I think it's really because I see so many people that are outside of, the gospel, when I say the gospel, they, they don't know Jesus. And for some people that know, do know Jesus or have knowledge or some awareness because they visit church from time to time, or maybe they have family members that are a part of a community of believers, they have some proximity or attachment, but they really don't have the knowledge base that will allow them to be able to understand who we are as Christians, where this all came from and what it is that we're trying to do. So today, and what I want to entitle chapter one, um, I want to look at the topic salvation. And the Greek word for this is soteriology, which is S-O-T-E-R-I-O-L-O-G-Y. And that really encompasses a broad umbrella of what we call the doctrines of salvation, which there are a number of things that come under salvation. But what I want to do is to take time to lay a foundation for us to really have an understanding and for that to really um, bring us so that we really know that we're not just doing something out of road where we just do it because parents did it, family doing it, but we really have an understanding of what it is we're doing, what salvation means and uh, what we're doing in that regard. So now we have an understanding. This is our first uh, session together. I'm not sure how many sessions. I want to preface this by saying that I'm not a theologist or a theologian. Let's get that right. I'm not a theologian, so I'm not going to be coming with lots of terms and stuff that maybe 
somebody who's gone to seminary or some college for that. This is just a foundation for our brethren where we lay people together. And what we're trying to do is to get a hold of the word of God and to make that make sense in our lives today. So if I will ad freely admit that I am not perfect, I don't know everything. And if I find out that I've said something that I think, well, I could improve on, or there's an area where that, that I, I may have made, um, inadvertently said something that I shouldn't have said, I will freely admit, yes, um, this was incorrect, or I could have said this better. So I'm asking for grace and forgiveness right up front. And just saying that we're learning together, but I just want to do what God has laid on my heart so that we can learn about salvation and what that means to us as believers today. So let's get started. So as I said, salvation is also known as soteriology, a Greek word. And some of the questions we may have are, what is the message of salvation? Why do we need to be saved? Does it really matter? What happens if I ignore the call to be saved? And these are the kind of issues and questions that I want to address during um, this more of a teaching or study series together where we sit and learn about the word of God. So let's lay uh, a foundation. So to properly address the reason why salvation is needed and why mankind needs to be saved, we have to trace that back to original sin, original sin. So what's original sin? Looking at scripture through the Bible, we can trace this path. We must first accept, though, let me say this straight away, because some people are not accepting the Bible as the true word of God and the veracity of scripture and the infallibility of the word of God. So for you to really get some value and for this to mean something, you must accept that the word of God is true and the word of God is, ac is accurate and uh, God doesn't make any mistakes. So those are the people that I'm um, speaking to or speaking with. OK, so we must first accept that the Bible is true. It's the inerrant word of God. Um, if we don't accept that it's accurate, infallible, then the discussion will not hold any weight. And this uh, message may be lost as far as um, and you as an individual may be concerned. So we're looking here at 2 Timothy 3.16 uh, to 17 King James Version. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. OK. So that's the foundation for the word of God being the word of God. I just believe that the word of God is true. And if I don't believe that the word of God is true, then I already have a faulty premise from where I'm starting. So let's look back at original sin. How did this come about? Looking at Genesis, which is the book of beginnings. The first chapter of Genesis states that in the beginning, God, in the beginning, God, in man, he created the heavens and the earth. We learn that the earth was a dark, empty place without life. Genesis 1, 1 to 2. The spirit of God began hovering and moving over this dark wasteland. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Genesis 1, 3. This was the start of creation. This is God at work. The chapter outlines how land, seas, animals, sun, moon, and everything that we call planet Earth was created. And the chapter of, that I just mentioned, Genesis, which is the book of the, the beginnings, is a good place to go back and read for further reference. In Genesis 1, 
26, we see where God spoke to his son, Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Spirit. How did they, how did he do that? He said, let us, let us make man in our own image and likeness. Let them have dominion. And we will reflect back to dominion. But it says, let them have dominion over the fish, sea, birds, cattle, and the entire earth. God created male and female and blessed them with limited authority. So this is where we talk about dominion, having the rule over. And we have limited authority. We don't have complete authority. Uh, even um, God, I would say God doesn't have authority because if God has authority, he got it from somebody and God is not subject to anyone. So God is all power. He doesn't have authority, but he has given us limited authority. So that may be something that so we have to get our head around because somebody will say, well, God has authority. Well, anybody that has authority, you're saying that you derive that authority from somebody else. And we know that God is a self-existing one. He doesn't require anybody else to exist. He exists all by himself. He's all powerful by himself. So he's not deriving his authority from anybody else. God is all power. And that's, that's where we are. So he's not getting authority from anybody else, but he's given us limited authority. And God validated everything and saw that this was very good. And this was a six day process. And then on the seventh day, God ceased from that work. And we can see all that in Genesis. And I believe I said Genesis 1, uh, 26. So we can read through to the end of the chapter there. Genesis 2, 7. God shows the process of how man was created from the uh, dust of the ground and how God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became, King James Version, I believe, says, became a living soul, a living person, a being. And um, for all intents and purposes, um, this person that God created was called Adam, A-D-A-M. And Adam was given a set of instructions. He was told to dress and take care of the Garden of Eden, look after the animals um, where he resided. He was given strict instructions that he could eat of every tree apart from one tree, one tree. So God was very specific. He said, Adam, I'm giving you limited authority here i'm giving you dominion over the animals over nature so to speak you know everything's subject to you within limits obviously we're not we, we can't take the ocean and tame it or anything like that but the animals and all the things the ground that grew fruit and produce and everything god gave him limited authority and he said um you're able to partake of all the produce and the fruit apart from this one tree. And this tree was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God told him that if he ate from that specific tree, that the consequence would be death. So this was very specific. It was non-negotiable. It wasn't like God said to him, well, if you feel like, have a go. He said, don't do that. So we can see there where God gave specific instructions and Adam, um, all Adam had to do was to obey um, in that regard. God recognized that Adam would be lonely because there were no other people, animals and stuff, but no other humans, no more people. And we are relational, all of us. We relate to other people. That's where the word relationship comes from. We relate to other people. No man is an island. None of us are um, 
will, I would say, I don't think anybody will do well if they're in isolation all the time. We, we need each other. We need to relate to each other. You know, whether it's siblings, mother and father, husband and wife, friends, uh, colleagues, co-workers, we all relate to each other because nobody's just living by themselves. So God wanted to um, do something about Adam's loneliness because he knew that he would be on his own. As a result, God said that he would make a help meet Genesis 2.18, a helper for Adam. Adam was placed in a deep sleep and a rib was taken from him and a woman was made. And she was called woman because she was taken out of man. Yeah. Now, Adam said that this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And this is where the scripture states that a man should leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they become one flesh. So that's where the one flesh principle came from. And this was the first marriage in the Bible. So we can see the foundation that was laid there. So the story of creation was perfect up until the day that the serpent, which is a disguise for the devil, began conversing with Adam's wife, who we know to be called, later she's called Eve. So we'll just start using her name, Eve. And who is the serpent or the devil? So everything was was going well until this serpent showed up in the garden. So let's find out who the serpent is. Isaiah 14, 12, King James Version said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? When Satan was in heaven, he was an anointed cherub. He was called Lucifer. So he was created by God just like any other angel, but he wasn't just an ordinary angel. He was a cherub. And scripture also talks about him being um, the worshiper and the one that orchestrated um, that in heaven. So you can imagine that Lucifer was probably very beautiful, created to um, uh, give worship to God along with other angels. And he was, um, yeah, he was part of uh, of heaven and everything that happened there. So how did he end up on earth? So Ezekiel 28, 17, that tells us that he was an anointed cherub. He had Satan, or Lucifer as he was then, had a big problem with God. And that's probably an understatement and very much simplified. Satan decided that he wanted to have his own kingdom equal to or above God. So he felt, well, I I know what's going on behind the throne. I know who God is. I know how this thing works. And I feel like I should get some worship too. So he managed to persuade some of the other angels, one third, the scripture said, to join with him in his pursuit of power and for his pursuit of worship. So he wanted to be powerful, just like God, because iniquity and jealousy had filled his heart. I will be like the Most High, Isaiah 14 and 13. Due to insurrection and treason, so we know that that couldn't happen in heaven. God could not allow for Lucifer to set up his own kingdom. There is only one God, and that God is the God that we worship. And God would not allow Lucifer, Satan, to set up his own kingdom 
and for there to be two kingdoms, parallel kingdoms, or two um, systems working side by side. So because of this treason insurrection and because of Satan's treachery, there was war in heaven. Yes, there was war. Lucifer and his angels fought with Michael, the archangel. And Satan deceived one third of the angels in heaven to defect with him. But he lost the war and he was evicted from heaven to earth. That's how he ended up in earth. Revelations 12, 7 to 9, Luke 10 and 18. So that explains a lot of that. Excuse me. <coughs> so you can imagine that Satan was really upset that the plan that he put in motion had failed and he was banished from heaven to earth, never to return back to his place in heaven. And he took one third let me say that again. One third of the angels with him. Okay. So it was a really great plan of his in his mind to deceive mankind because of his hatred for God. So we can now see that when he slipped into the garden, he was already there. And he obviously probably saw all of what was going on and decided I'm going to hatch a plan here where I can cause man to fall from his rightful place. So the devil was cunning and deceitful with evil intentions. He said to Eve, is it really possible that God doesn't want you to eat from the trees? Genesis 3 and 1. The devil listened to the conversation that God had had with Adam and he was waiting for an opportunity to contradict God. The woman told the serpent that along with her husband, they could eat from every tree except the tree in the center of the garden, the one that God forbade, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan, the serpent, said, that's not true. God knows that the moment that you eat from this tree, you will become like God and know what he knows. You will know good and evil and your eyes will be opened. Mm. Eve looked at the tree and saw that it looked great. The fruit looked desirable. And in her mind, she thought about what Satan had said. So see what happens when um, the devil begins to plant. If he was able to convince one third of the angels in heaven to defect with him, with his plan to set up his own kingdom. Um, we we misunder, uh, you know, we underestimate um, or we misunderstand Satan's plan. We underestimate him. He's very cunning and he never gives up. And even though he was thrown out of heaven, he made up his mind that he's not going to go to hell by himself. And you can see that his plan has always been to interject the mind of people, mankind, and to have them shift from the purpose and the plan of God. So it's not really news that sometimes we're thinking or we struggle and we think, well, I've got two opinions. I've got two minds about this, even when we know what the right thing is, because Adam and Eve were right in the garden. They knew what the right thing was and they still managed to do the wrong thing. So she looked and she ate some of the fruit. And this was despite God's instructions. And she called her husband and he also ate some of the fruit and they were both deceived. It appeared that when Satan, what Satan said was true, it looked that way. 
because their eyes were indeed opened and they knew that they were naked. Initially, when they were married, the scripture said in Genesis 2.25 that the man and the woman were naked and they weren't ashamed, but their, their eyes hadn't been opened to certain things. So really they were living their life and everything was fine until the enemy came in and sowed that seed in their mind. That's when things started to change. Be careful of when the enemy sows stuff in our mind. But... Something happened after they disobeyed God. For the first time, shame set in. Isn't that right? When we do something against God's plan, don't we notice how we feel shame or we feel hurt or condemnation in our heart because we know that we've done something that we shouldn't do. This is what happened here. Adam and Eve made some clothing to cover their nakedness. And that's sometimes what we do as well. We try to cover what we've done, uh, not successfully because we know that God knows everything. You can never hide from God, but we do try. So um, they make clothing to cover their nakedness, which was a symbolic for their disobedience, which is called sin. So we can now see where original sin comes from. This was the first sin. And it's important to know, as I've just explained, that Satan will never tell you the truth. John 8, 44 states, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language because he is the father of lies. There is no truth in Satan. He will give you what can, you, you might consider to be a half truth, but he never tells you the whole truth. He's never going to tell you the whole truth. And because of his knowledge of heaven and God, he knew that if mankind disobeyed God, that would cause separation. Just as he was banished, banished from heaven and from God eternally, he wanted mankind to have the same. And it looked like his evil plan worked. Genesis 3 and 8 shows that God communed with his creation on a regular basis, and this was normal for them. And when they knew that God was approaching for their usual meeting, they hid themselves from God. And God said, where are you, Adam? And he responded, I was afraid and I hid because I was naked. God asked, how did you know this? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Look at this. Adam then said, he blamed his wife, saying, the woman that you gave me, gave me the fruit and I ate. So we can see there where he didn't take personal responsibility. Even though his wife called him, he could have said no. So he didn't take personal responsibility. Then the woman now, she's not taking personal responsibility either. The woman Eve blamed the serpent when confronted with her wrong. She said, he beguiled me and he outwitted me. So God said to Satan, the serpent, you are cursed above all domestic animals. You will crawl on your belly forever. These are the consequences of what happened. To Eve, he said he would make her childbearing painful and challenging as a consequence. And her desire would be to her husband to please him and he would rule over her. For Adam, the result of his sin of listening to his wife and disobeying God, he would suffer because the ground is cursed because of him. Instead of enjoying the benefits of the produce as before, you will toil to eat all the days of your life. 
man would have to work hard to live and would ultimately die. He said, from dust you came and to dust you will return. Genesis 3, 17 to 19. It was at this point that they actually named Eve and called her the mother of all living. So God was very gracious. He gave them clothing. And he said, mankind are become as one of us. So what God was saying there, that mankind have broken our, our holy ordinance and they're they have become like one of us. In other words, there are things that they now know that we did not authorize and therefore we're going to have to do certain things to try to, well, not to try, but to address and rectify completely what had happened. So God caused mankind to be evicted they learned something that they would die. When the scripture said that they would die, it didn't mean that they were going to immediately die because as we can see from scripture that they lived for some considerable time. But it just meant that when mankind would have lived eternally as God intended, the consequences of original sin means that everyone that is born will ultimately die. So God evicted them from the Garden of Eden, where Adam was formed and Eve was taken from his side. And God made it so that there was absolutely no way that they could return to the garden. God placed a cherubim or placed cherubims, angels, with a flaming sword in every direction as a deterrent. So we know that they couldn't go back. But the consequences of this original sin was dire. So it meant that Satan, who was already banished, uh, was further cursed. But for mankind, the idyllic lifestyle that we would have had, living and enjoying all of the blessings of, of nature and the animals and everything that God had provided, that all changed in that moment. An eviction from the garden meant that um, we no longer enjoyed those, those benefits. Scripture said that the ground was cursed. So it meant that uh, the growing process, the dealing with the animals, all the things that would have been so easy for Adam, that all changed. And on top of that, mankind would die. We would no longer have eternal life. And this is what salvation is all about, as we see further in the series. So now we can see where original sin is and when it happened. Initially, God gave man dominion, which means he ruled over everything in creation that was prepared for him. He didn't work. He lived in paradise. Sin happened and it caused separation between man and God. Man disobeyed, disobedience is sin. This means that man himself caused the separation. God can't tolerate sin because he's a holy God. And there is no sin in heaven. And sinful people can't remain in the presence of God. So we can now see that God's original plan for man was for them to live eternally in this blissful paradise it sounds too good to be true but that's what god's original intention was this was god's design for his creation and god loves his creation so much that he gave them this, this idyllic life with the worship of god and a relationship with him god communed daily with man so it was his intention for this to continue so we can see the original plan of god and how original sin disrupted all of this, led to curses, led to eviction from the garden, leaves mankind now to live a finite life with stress, poverty, sickness, death, all kinds of things that we didn't have before. The devil was really 
you know, upset that God loved mankind so much. He thought that why would God love mankind so much? Psalms 8 and 8 through 6 said, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You've made them a little lower than the angels, crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hand. You put everything under their feet. He really wanted to draw a wedge between God and his creation. He wanted adoration and equality, but God threw him out of heaven and he will use any means to pull mankind against God. God is a loving God and he made a way for mankind to get back into right relationship with him. And this is called the gift of salvation. And what I am going to do, this um, is quite a, a lengthy session, but I just wanted to lay the foundation that this is how salvation came about. So some of the questions I asked at the beginning, do we need to be saved? What if we ignore this? Is it necessary? What's salvation all about? I hope that in this um, first session that I've kind of like touched on and explained some of the reasons why we need salvation, that because sin came in to the earth, Satan was there, but mankind chose their destiny and fell. And because sin came into the earth, then the remedy back to God is salvation. And this is what this um, series of discussions is all about. I omitted to pray at the very beginning, which was remiss of me, and I will be closing out in prayer. My hope is that somebody, I think that the whole reason of doing this is that somebody will hear who may not really understand what's this all about. I'm really aiming to strengthen the belief of those of us who are Christians and to reach the lost. Because as I said, redeeming the time, the time is short. We need to make impact. We need to, um, to win the lost. And that's the whole point of this sermon series or teaching series. So I hope that you were blessed by this today. And I do apologize um, for not praying at the beginning. I am going to pray now. And then when we meet again next time, we will talk further about the doctrine of salvation. Salvation, why is it necessary? And how we can um, work through um, this in our personal life. Scripture said that we work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. And I want you to know that the time is short and it's not time for us to um, live anyhow and believe that we have endless time. I want us to know that the time is short and that we need to redeem the time, make an impact for the kingdom of God. Father, in your name we come today. I thank you, Lord, that in the midst of all this, when we look at what happened and how mankind was deceived by the enemy and we lost our dominion, we had limited authority and dominion in the earth and we lost that and we found ourselves naked but you had to give us clothing and we found ourselves in the world where things changed so much that what came to us very easily no longer does that. And sometimes we wonder why our lives are the way it is but it's because sin came into the world, mankind lost their place but thank you God that you've given us an opportunity to return back to you through the free gift of salvation I pray today Lord as we outline um, about sin and how sin came into the world and as we move forward and touch other areas concerning salvation my prayer Lord is that somebody will hear, hallelujah, the message of salvation 
and that they will know that there is a hell to shun and that there is a heaven to gain and that we are living on limited time and you will return. And you said this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all the world as a witness. Then shall the end come. Help me, Lord, to do my part to be. John said, I am a voice, hallelujah, crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. I'm just a voice, Lord, crying out and trying to make straight so that others will hear the voice and the message of salvation and respond with all their hearts. So we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to discuss and reason together. And I pray, Lord, that it will sow fruit that will abound to our account for Kingdom Pray Women 365 and the kingdom of God will be established. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. And we give you all honor, all glory, all power. And it is in Jesus' mighty name we pray. So brethren, it has been my delight to be with you. I look forward to another session. I know that this has probably been very long. I'm hoping it's not been very boring. And we will get to more meaty, I guess, discussion. But we have to lay this foundation. May God bless you. May God keep you. Until we meet again next time.